whenever somebody asks me, how would I go about pricing this? I step back and ask, what decision are they making? Coffee's for closers only. So we've established my proposal to stand in principle. Now we're just haggling over price. <laughs> Let's see how much we're going for on eBay. I mean, it's the same as Dunkin' Donuts. Cost 15 times the price. Welcome to Impact Pricing, the podcast where we discuss pricing, value, and the intricate relationships between them. I'm Mark Stiving, host of the podcast, and today, for episode two, we're already going to do something a little bit different. Last week, I had the opportunity to interview Kirk Bowman, podcaster extraordinaire at the Art of Value podcast. Today, Kirk is going to interview me as a way for you to get to know your host just a little bit better. Welcome, Kirk, and please take it easy on me. Mark, I couldn't be hard on you if I tried, just because we think so much alike. And by the way, congratulations on a great idea as a way to introduce your audience to you by having me interview you. So let's dive right in. How did you get into pricing in the first place? Wow. I probably remember being, say, 10 years old, going to the grocery store with my mother, and I would see the prices that ended in nine. And I always wondered why companies did that. Did they think we're stupid or something? Right? We know 99 is the same as a dollar. Fast forward a whole bunch of years, and I found myself as a doctoral student at UC Berkeley, and I'm playing with scanner panel data. So I've got yogurt data, ketchup data, tuna fish data. And this is the data that happens when you use your loyalty card. They collect so much information about you and what you bought. And I was able to do some statistical analysis to actually figure out if that nine cents works or not. Turns out it does work. I wrote a dissertation about it and it was fascinating. But as I went back to become an academic, so I left, I graduated, I got a job at Ohio State, I decided to create a pricing course because this whole concept of how do people use prices when they're making a decision are just fascinating to me. And from there, it just bloomed. But that was the beginning. I love this topic. Well, I think that's probably a good topic for a future episode is the whole idea of pricing psychology, right? This idea of 99 cents doesn't make a difference. And why does it make a difference? But I don't want us to go there right now. Next question I want to know, and this is actually a question I literally want to know the answer to. You had a sweet gig at Promatic Marketing. Why'd you give it up? Boy, it was a really sweet gig too. I'll tell you, I love the company Pragmatic Marketing. I had an opportunity to do something that I love to do, which is teach people. Every day I would stand in front of a room full of people and, and have an opportunity to impact their careers and maybe even their life. And the only reason I ended up leaving Pragmatic was because they wanted 100% of my focus on their company. And I felt like I was teaching people how to run businesses but I wasn't doing it anymore. I was just teaching. And I had this itch. I had to go do it on my own one more time. After tons and tons of deliberation, I realized that I know this topic of pricing so well. I am so good at training and standing in front of rooms. I thought surely I could find something that would work in this world of pricing uh, where I could, I could make a living and practice this concept of building the business that I was teaching for, for so many years. It takes courage, especially when you have a sweet opportunity like that, to step out on your own. So congratulations for making that choice and welcome back to the world of being an entrepreneur. Yeah, let's see if you say that again in a year. <laughs> Based on some of the off mic conversations we've had, I'm not worried at all. You're stepping out of your own. What type of companies do you love to work with? Let's go from really broad to really narrow. Um, first off, I feel like I understand pricing from lots and lots of different company perspectives. But if I were to take the first slice at how would you segment that, I would say I focus mostly on B2B type companies. And the reason I say that is B2B companies have the ability to put dollar values on things. They can measure value to their customers so much easier than we could measure the value of a new shirt to some a consumer. I love the concept of measuring value, so B2B is a really big deal to me. If we take the next step down, companies with direct sales forces are, boy, they're just such a sweet spot. 
And the reason for that is, first off, the whole company has to understand value, but the sales force has to be able to communicate value to the buyers in, in the marketplace. And if everybody hasn't done their job before the salesperson gets a hold of a product and a message, then how do they, how do they even do their job? And then let's say we've given them really good product, really good message. Now the question is, how do they tease out value from the buyer? How do they understand how much value this product is going to have in the buyer's mind and the buyer's business? Maybe we use that for negotiation purposes, or maybe we just use that to defend the price that we already have. But that's a really big deal. And then finally, if I slice it even a little bit more narrow, I really like hardware companies. And the reason I like hardware companies so much is because they are the most messed up companies when it comes to pricing. Hardware companies almost always do cost plus pricing. And it's a mentality. Most hardware companies nowadays with the internet of things coming out, they're trying to build in software, value added software, and yet the entire company mindset is, oh, software is free, we'll give that away so that we can sell more hardware. And just the fact that they're so messed up makes them fun to work with. So since you niched down, if I can say that, to mm -hmm. hardware companies, who's a hardware company that's doing it well? And then who's a hardware company that's doing it poorly? Well, from a big company perspective, one of the things, one company that does it really nicely is Tesla. Have you seen Tesla's pricing? One of the I have not simply because I like to put gasoline in my car. <laughs> if you ever get a chance to drive a Tesla, what an amazing experience. But Tesla, every uh, product that comes off the floor is identical. And they have $20,000 worth of software upgrades you could put in your car. That is amazing. They are really selling uh, value and they've got a really different uh, business model when it comes to that. So give them huge kudos. You just got my attention. I'm going to have to do some more research on this. There may have, that sounds like a future topic for somebody on my show. But anyway, I digress. Go on. Tesla's That's doing it well. What else would okay. you add to that? Other companies that I think are doing it well the companies that are doing IoT, Internet of Things, really well right now are starting to figure this out. The real value of IoT, of Internet of Things, isn't in the hardware. They typically sell hardware and they have to get the hardware out, but the real value is in what can you do with it? What problems are you solving with it? I've been working with a company lately called Lytix, and they sell video cameras for trucks. And what's fascinating is, yeah, of course you want the camera there so that you can see what's going on, but what you really want are all the services that go on behind that. How do you do the image processing? How do you know if uh, there really was someone in the way or not, or whose fault the accident was, or there's so much that you can do behind the scenes with the software piece, but you have to sell the hardware first. And I find that amazingly fun and valuable. The companies that don't do it well, I'd hate to single anybody out, but you could take one of the other car companies. That would be an easy one. They're not, uh, they're certainly doing cost plus pricing as they do their pricing. And I would say any company today that is still doing cost plus pricing, which is most hardware companies, they're not doing it correctly. They're not doing it well. It's interesting you mentioned car companies. One of the recent guests I had on my show, Dr. Reginald Thomas Lee, has written extensively about just the whole crazy mindset of cost plus pricing, even declaring the death of cost accounting. It was, it's so easy to pick on car companies, right? Just pick one. What's hard is to, is to pick a successful one, and you did, right? Tesla. What they're doing sounds a lot to me like Joe Pine's book, The Experience Economy. Hopefully, I'm getting the title of that right. But anyway, the idea that, you know, hey, here, the car is a piece of hardware and we're going to sell you the software upgrades. Now, that's cool. Yeah. Have you heard of ludicrous mode on the Tesla? Yes, I have. In fact, a good friend of mine who is one of my pricing mentors, Ed Kless, had an Uber driver pick him up in one of those 
that was how he was introduced to ludicrous mode. I believe ludicrous mode is a software upgrade if you're buying a newer version Tesla. Given their business model, that is no surprise. Yes. <laughs> so, Mark, what are some of the biggest issues you see with companies on pricing? It's funny because a lot of companies like to say the words value-based pricing. Oh, we do value-based pricing. And I think they don't understand what that means. If I were going to define value-based pricing, it would be, first off, if it were perfect, we would figure out how much a customer is willing to pay, and that's what we would charge them. And that willingness to pay, of course, is based on how much value they get out of our product. It's impossible to figure out how much somebody's willing to pay us. So I think of value-based pricing is how do we get closer and closer to figuring that out? There are always steps we can take, ways we can get nearer and nearer to that. And I think a lot of companies five years ago, 10 years ago, they said, oh, we're gonna change our pricing methodology so that we get closer to willingness to pay. We're gonna call that value-based pricing. And now that's what we do. We do value-based pricing. And in truth, what they did was they took a step closer but then they stopped. One of the biggest problems that we see is that companies aren't focused on how do we get closer and closer and closer to capturing that customer's willingness to pay. And step number one is adopting the attitude that says we do want to get closer. And then step number two is almost always going to be price segmentation. How do we get to value different customers how do we figure out how much different customers value our products or our offers? I'd say those are probably the biggest issues we have. It's interesting you draw the analogy between companies who say they're doing value pricing versus those who actually are. We see a lot of the same thing in my world where I'm dealing with professionals who are selling their time. Their first step they take is they'll just put a fixed price on it. Now, the fixed price is based on an hourly estimate but they think that's a step in the right direction. And it is from a customer standpoint of getting a fixed price, but it misses the mark so far. So I understand kind of pricing in sheep's clothing, if you will. One of the things that your comment about segmentation brought to mind is the idea that the closer you can get to pricing the individual customer rather than the product or service, in other words, the individual outcome for that specific customer rather than a more general outcome that maybe a category of customers are trying to achieve, the better your pricing is. Thoughts on that? Oh, I think you're spot on right. In the field that you work in, which is mostly professionals, you often deal one at a time with individual customers and say, yes, I'm going to build this solution for you or produce this outcome for you. In, when you get to the big corporate world, we've built a product. I've built a Tesla. I've built a camera to go into a car or a truck, right? I've built a product. Now what I've got to do is figure out how I can determine, usually it's going to be tiers of willingness to pay, buckets. And you like to use the word options. I usually, usually use the phrase good, better, best when we get to that space. And if we can focus on this good, better, best outcome, then that's one way that we have to get people to self-select into the right category and capture more from different segmentation. But I agree with you completely. If there was a way to, to price individually, then that would be the holy grail. Well, and I'll add the difference between pricing the individual customer versus possibly pricing a segment of customers is really volume. And the professionals I work with I'm trying to get them down. I mean, I know a company in UK, they're an accounting company. They have 50 customers and they are one of the most profitable in the country. In fact, they were asked to participate in a benchmarking survey for companies. And when they sent their data in, the company that was running the survey said, sorry, your numbers are so much better than everybody else, they must be wrong. Hmm. And they had 50 customers. so. Versus, you know, what you're describing and the customers you're working with, right, are, are working with a bigger customer base. And so you have to fit your pricing, how you approach pricing to the size of your customer base. But the size of your customer base is one factor in how you determine price. 
Oh, absolutely right. And with 50 customers, you could, you could relatively easily price each individual customer. Which is exactly what they do. What I have learned from you is that you're an expert at helping customers, obviously, that have more than 50 customers, for example, a hardware company where volume is necessary, but still helping them do premium pricing in that situation. Oh, absolutely. There's so many things that we can do to increase the amount of, I like to think of it as how much value are we delivering to our customer? How can we capture more of that value? And the many, many things we can do. So if somebody hears you say many things, could you give me an example? (laughs) Well, by the way, one of the things that I'm doing now is I'm mentoring companies do an hour phone call with them once a week. And it just gives me an opportunity to hear their problems and coach them through their problems, as opposed to me coming out and actually doing consulting work or helping them do something. Um, So I'm helping them become better and more of a pricing expert themselves. And last week I was looking at a presentation that a client was going to give to their sales force. Now how you communicate things to your sales force is huge they had said, here's what our price is. So here's what our list price is. And then here are the ways that you could figure out what your discount authority level would be so that you could then figure out what the, the price is that you could charge the customer. And they had it written such that the salesperson would look at that and say, Oh, here's the price I should charge. And, and just that nuance, we had to fix that to say, no, 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 that's not the right answer. The right answer is here's the price. The price is the list price. Now, if you have to discount, here's the lowest you could possibly go. And just in the way you present this to sales makes a huge difference as to how they're going to behave. I cringe as soon as I heard the word discount. I mean, that speaks of a mindset right there that you have to help change. Yeah. In the B2B space, oftentimes we do give discounts. I know you're thinking, I am not a huge opponent of discounts in the following sense. If I set a really high list price, a relatively high list price, and I know that different customers value my product differently, then discounts are a way for me to do price segmentation on a customer by customer basis, as long as I've trained my sales force to do this intelligently and well. Well, I think you just nailed it, right? It's not simply working with one individual, but the sales force, they have to adopt the mindset of how do you truly price? How do you talk about price? What's the language you use? What are the questions you ask? Do you spend time coaching either sales managers or sales teams? Oh, absolutely. The Ed class who you brought up earlier today, on their podcast, The Soul of Enterprise, I first heard the concept called value conversations. And I just fell in love with that concept. I went out and studied it and I've been practicing it and I've been teaching that because it is so powerful. Now, I call it something slightly different. I call it a value journey map because in the end, what we're doing is we're helping the salesperson discover where that value is as our buyers are going through the journey of discovering value. But absolutely, I think that teaching salespeople how to have that conversation, how to ask the right questions, how to put a number on the way customers value our products is crucial. I like the fact that you mentioned it as a skill because it is something that can be learned. That's one of the things that I tell my customers, look, pricing is not something you're taught. It's mentioned as one of the, I think the four P's, you know, in your marketing 101 class, maybe, but it's glossed over so fast. Nobody teaches pricing. It goes, you know, in the bucket of all the things they didn't teach me at business school, but yet it is something that can be learned. And it actually probably is one of the most important skills you can have. I couldn't agree more. That's huge. We're going to wrap it up here in a second, but one of the things you mentioned that I wanted to just get your take on is beer pricing at the national championship game. And let's put this in perspective. So we've had this Alabama Crimson Tide 
rivalry going on the past four years. And, of course, this year Clemson came out on top. But beer pricing at the football game? I just saw a pricing article the other day that said that they were charging $12 for a domestic bottle of beer, which if you go to the grocery store, you can buy a six pack for what? Six bucks, eight bucks, something like that. So $12 for a single bottle is incredible. And, and the question becomes, how do they get away with that? I, and obviously in my vernacular, the way I think about this, is that we've got will I and which one decisions that are happening all the time. Will I decisions or am I going to buy something? Which one decisions or which one am I going to go buy? And sometimes we can structure business such that buyers are only making a will I decision. Think of popcorn at the movie theater. The reason popcorn at the movie theater is so expensive is once you walk in the door, it's am I going to buy popcorn or not? Now we go to the national championship game and $12, this is certainly a will I decision. Now that you're in the door, am I going to have a beer or not? Ugh. I mean, the answer is probably yes, but $12, maybe not too many. But I think the other thing that's driving this is the price of the tickets. The price of the tickets were high, although they were down a little bit this year. Because the average price of the tickets are so high, they're thinking, gee, if you're going to spend 500 bucks to get in the door, why wouldn't you spend 12 bucks on a beer? No big deal. Um, but I don't know. What do you think? So it's interesting you mentioned the idea of, you know, will I versus which one. I phrase it a little bit different. In fact, I think you and I talked about this when you were on my show. Just the idea that what I teach is when you offer options, that the question goes from, will I hire you to how will I hire you? So again, there's a mental shift there. And not to get into the difference between how you phrase it and how I phrase it, the point is that there is a mental process going on and you need to understand that. You need to be able to be aware of it and talk to your customer in an intelligent way that helps guide that decision, not in a manipulation, but actually guiding them toward the best outcome possible, even if that outcome is not working with you or the company you represent. That is so true. Buyers don't understand our products or the outcomes they could achieve with our products. And what's funny is we don't understand our buyers. If we don't have one of those value conversations, there's no way that we could fit either side understands the value. And it really does come down to value. In fact, I love the way you introduce your show as you say, look, it's about pricing, value, and the relationship between them. And when you think about the relationship between two things, on the one hand, you go, well, it's only two things. How complex could it be? And I go, are you married? How <laughs> complex is that relationship? Okay. I would say pricing and value is right up there with that level of complexity, but it can be done well because think about people you know. You know people who failed at marriage. You know people who succeeded at it. I, As an example, my grandparents hit their 75th wedding anniversary before they passed away. Wow. Wow. And I just have to say, in March of this year, my wife and I will be married 30 years. No wonder you're so good at pricing. <laughs> I think there's a correlation there, but I'm getting this a little bit off tangent. What's one piece of pricing advice that you think could have a big impact on our audience? Well, I mentioned two earlier that I think are huge. One is adopt this attitude of value-based pricing and always improving. The other one is start thinking about price segmentation and how do we capture different amounts of value from different buyers. The third one I mentioned a little bit in the answer to the national championship game. But I think this is just a fundamental concept. And that's this concept of will I and which one. Because people are not price sensitive when they're making the will I decision. And people are very price sensitive when they're making a which one decision. And as companies, we have the ability to build products that are just will I products. Or maybe we, we create different situations where people are just deciding whether they want our product or not. Or, 
And this is a really important one when you have a sales force. Sometimes we go out and we find customers, they were referred to us, and they're not looking at our competition. If we can identify these will I situations, then we realize we don't have to discount dramatically. We don't have to give these big concessions in order to win these deals because there really isn't a competitor in there. And this, this is such a fundamental concept, it pervades my thinking almost constantly. Whenever somebody asks me, how would I go about pricing this? I step back and ask, what decision are they making? And, and I just, I think if people could adopt that attitude, it would have a huge impact on how much they could achieve. As you were describing at that time, I think I realized where kind of your approach to that and my approach to that overlap. They're not opposed to each other, they overlap. And so I'm gonna throw this out there because it's kind of an epiphany for me that I just had thanks to you. But starting with what you said, you know, which one? In other words, looking at competitors. Then will I, meaning, okay, am I gonna buy from this person or not? And then I think you can go one level deeper which is how will I? And that's where the idea of offering choices comes in. But again, that's a whole nother show. So Mark, this has been a fun episode. How would you want to conclude? Thank you for everything you just did. It was amazing. I hope our listeners enjoyed that. As we're getting this podcast launched though, everybody's feedback is absolutely crucial to making it valuable. Would you please send your feedback to Mark at impactpricing.com? Also, feel free to send in questions, and we'll try to answer them on a future episode. And finally, please join us next week for a new episode of Impact Pricing.